Thank you, Paul, and thank you, worship team. As you uh, are getting used to these new places, I hope that that's not throwing you off your game. Uh, someone is here today, you know, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and, and you guys appreciated the pastors uh, last week that are on staff, but we also have others who are serving amongst us, who uh, we affectionately call Pastor One, is Pastor Mike uh, Broyles, so... <laughs> Um, Pastor Mike, um, if you would just come for a moment. <laughs> Freshly returned from the Dominican Republic where Joe saved Pastor Broyles' life. <laughs> just ask about the story. But here's a little token of our appreciation from Valencia Hills Community Church. Say we love you and thank you for everything that you do, investing uh, your experiences and your love for Jesus. Here amongst his people. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I did that this morning because um, at the end of the sermon, you might have questions. I want you to go right to Pastor Mike. <laughs> so, good morning, VHCC. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Yeah, that's what kind of sermon it is this morning. Aren't you glad you're here? In this corner, weighing 95 pounds, soaking wet, theologically speaking, Pastor Dennis. And in this corner, the reigning heavyweight champion of the world, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Wow. You might be thinking, well, why all the theatrics? It's only 13 measly little verses. But I'm here to tell you, to quote, our own resident theologian, Ed Ediger, these 13 verses have caused more consternation, been the subject of more debate, ha and have resulted in more divergent interpretations than almost any other passage of similar length in any of the rest of the scripture. So these are difficult passages, and I, I need you to stick with me this morning. So if you brought your Bible with you, I hope that you did. I'd invite you to join me in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, as we look together and find out what all of the fuss is about. It says this, what, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You might be asking yourself, well, what is the problem? That seems pretty uh, straightforward. What's the big dealio? Here's the problem. The question that comes to our minds and hearts as we're reading through this is, or should be, are these really believers that James is writing to? Do, do they have real faith as verified by works, or do they have bogus faith? 
because they don't have the right works or works at all to back it up. So we have to ask ourselves, is James's point to ferret out false believers? Does he want to expose some that he's already called brothers as not really brothers because they have counterfeit faith? Now, the big dogs. I'm talking about the guys who are stellar scholars and respected as biblical bigwigs. Say yes, James is putting the kibosh on false faith. Uh, on false, false faith as evidenced by no works to substantiate their saving faith. And I want you to know that it is not easy for me to not just play nice and go along with the Pipers and the Moos and the MacArthur's. They reason that salvation is what's in view here. Where I'm prone to say, I don't think so. Rather, I believe James wants his readers to be sure that they've got a grasp on vibrantly living out the reality of kingdom come. You say, okay, well, how do you come to your convictions? It's really quiet right now. Well, what do you, what do you think that you can outwit, that you can outplay, that you can outlast the big boys? Honestly, I don't think that I can, but I have an advantage over them. I don't have to be uh, worried about being accepted into their tribe. And I don't have to worry about future endorsement, book deals, or speaking engagements. So I get to worry on what is most important to me when dealing with any passage, and that is context. In fact, there are three tried and true rules to, to um, understanding any biblical passage. For correct interpretation, are you ready? I'll wait till you get your pens and your papers out because you want to get these three. Ready? Here they are. The three tried and true rules of biblical interpretation is context, context, and context. Context is the circumstances that form the setting for an event, a statement, or an idea. And in terms of, of which it can be fully understood and assessed. So to take something out of con context is to be in danger of misunderstanding or misusing the statement, idea, or in this case, the meaning of Scripture as intended by the author. All right. So this is not new in our study of James. We have from the very beginning established the context of who James is writing to. By the way, we didn't have to, to, to dig really deep to try to discover who it is he's writing to. He nails it for us right out in front. He's, he's not trying to hide who it is that he's writing to. He starts off his letter, my brothers, which is clearly those who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then the context continues into chapter 2, which is where we're camped this morning. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Who's he writing to? My brothers who are believers, which means they are saved. That they've been regenerated, that they've already had the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed into their lives. They are born again believers. And then he gets to the first six words of verse 14, which establishes our context for this morning. What good is it, my brothers? So the issue can't be salvation if you're talking to the saved, can it? If you're talking to the saved, the issue cannot be their salvation. So what is the issue that James is bringing up to the beleaguered, battered, persecuted for their faith in Jesus to save them believers? James doesn't want to bum them out. He wants to encourage them to live kingdom come lives that testify that Jesus Christ has radically transformed them from dead in their sins to being made alive in Christ Jesus. So the issue, I believe, based on context, is not eternal life, but rather profit. Profit. 
So let's take a look at the uh, text, and in it we'll find that James asks two questions right up front. He, he asks, what good is it, or what profit is it? My brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? So what profit is it, and can that kind of faith save him? So right off the start, the issue is not eternal life, but rather good or profit. What good is it? What benefit is there? Well, what is profitable? What will help most in your kingdom come Christian life? Faith or works? And then the second question, can such faith save him? Now, this is a negative rhetorical question in the Greek, which means that it has the implied answer of an emphatic no. That, save, that, that faith can't save him. The faith that doesn't have deeds and so we're surprised, right, by the answer no. Because whenever we talk about the word faith and the word save, ultimately we think that we're being saved from H-E double hockey sticks, right? That's why we think that this is our eternal destiny that we're being saved from. And so if they have faith and save in the same, in the same scripture, in the same sentence, we're talking about our eternal destinies. But here, save means to deliver, and we must understand by the context, context what we're delivered from. Let's give you an example in Ephesians chapter 2, 89, which is our classic saved by faith, um, uh, you know, scripture that we hold as, as very dear to us. This is how we're saved, right? For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, if you follow the context back, you can deduce that the thing that you're delivered from is the wrath of God on your sins. In fact, it says in verse 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. Saved from what? Saved from eternal hell because that's what our sin deserved. So God in a remedy for us, granted us grace and granted us the ability by faith to receive that grace. And when we received it, we're saved from what? From hell, from eternal destruction, from this eternal separation from, from God. But the context in, in James chapter 2 is a little bit different. In fact, we have to go back a little bit in James chapter 2 to find out what we need to be saved from. If it was from hell, he would have told us hell, but he doesn't tell us that. In fact, in James chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 that we looked at last week, and then in James chapter 3, verse 1, which we're going to look at next week, it's a different deliverance for the believer that we need. He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment Without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So James is saying, hey, we, believers, we need to be saved from some type of judgment. Some type of, uh, of judgment that we're going to face. And, and if we haven't shown mercy, then mercy is not going to be shown to us. In James chapter 3, verse 1, he brings out the same concept of judgment for believers. And he talks about the judgment for, on Christian teachers. He says, not many of you should presume to be teachers. Why? My brothers, my born-again believered friends, my, my ones who've, been, uh, who've had the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed into your life, you, not many of you should presume to be teachers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Uh-oh. In chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he talks about a judgment and in James 3.1, he talks about a judgment on teachers who are, of course, believers. So he's bracketing the type of judgment that Christians will face. And apparently, this judgment is not on our faith. This judgment is on our works. And by the way, there's only one such type of judgment in the Bible... And it's used several times by Jesus and, and by, by Paul and here by James. 
And it's when we face the judgment seat of Christ, often called the Bema seat. And there, believers will be judged based on the works that they've done in their body. That's while they're alive, whether good or evil, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And there's a reward that's going to be handed out and eternal privileges that are going to be distributed at this judgment for believers. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12 through 15, it says this. If any man builds on this foundation, the foundation, of course, is on our salvation. If any man uh, lives out his kingdom come, right? And he's building on that using gold and, and, and silver and costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. His work, see that work? His work, this is what he does as a believer for the cause of kingdom come. His work will be shown for what it is because the day... See, there's a day coming, and that's the day of judgment before Christ. There's a great white throne judgment, which, listen, we won't have to face because our names are already written in the Lamb's book of life. Those who have not, had, uh, have not found a relationship in Jesus Christ, they have not put their faith in Jesus to save them, they're going to be judged right then, and they're going to be found lacking because they're not perfect. Only those who put their faith in Christ you see, by one sacrifice, we are made perfect for how long? Forever. Those that he's making holy, Hebrews 10, 14. We, it's already been done for us. Our name's already been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But there's going to be a second judgment, a judgment for believers based on what they've done on that day. And on that day, all of our works are going to be brought to light. It will be revealed with fire. And then fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built on survives, he'll receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So he's not talking about here losing our salvation because we don't have enough works. He's talking here about us getting a reward for our living kingdom come. So this is what James has in mind, I believe, right here saying that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and although we already have the wonderful gift of eternal life, the issue on that day will be, what did you do in this life with the gift and the talents and the abilities that God gave you? In that day, James says, faith alone will not profit. You're going to need some works. And these beleaguered, belittled, persecuted Christians have asked, what role do works play? And James has answered, before the judgment seat of Christ, it's works that will be profitable. So the issue here is profit. And then James gives an example of this. It's a good example. He says, listen, don't just talk. Don't, don't just talk about this great faith that you have in Jesus Christ. You've got to live it out. You've got to do something. And he illustrates what he means about living, believers, about living kingdom come. He says, look, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, hey, uh, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? What profit is it? James says, look, you, you, you look around you and you see brothers and sisters in Christ who have need don't just pray for them. Do something about it. Don't just articulate the faith. Well, I believe that, that God is going to provide for you. You allow God to make you the conduit of love and concern and resources to meet the very real and present need. This is what Jesus said. Look, he said, look, uh, if you give a cup of cold water in, in my name, you will not lose your reward in heaven. What reward is he talking about? Not salvation. He's talking about before the Bema seat. You're not going to lose your rewards that, that, that you are storing up for yourself by living kingdom come. That's what he's talking about. Jesus even says we've got to do something. We offer a cup of cold water in his name. Well, James is saying the same thing here. He says that when you're standing before Christ in heaven 
and he asks you, how have you helped those who are in need? How did you help the marginalized um, foster youth who are about to be you know, uh, kicked out of, uh, of the system? How did you help them? Well, I prayed for them. Well, that's a good start, but what did you do? You had the opportunity. There was two people who stood up here and said, look, this is what our hearts are, are beating for so that people can hear and know the favor of God. And, and the way they're going to hear and know is we're going to minister to them. And you see right there, it op opened an opportunity for you to be involved. And so James is saying, you, you got to do something. Don't just pray about it. Don't just think about it. Don't just say, well, uh, be well fed and be warm. It says you give them clothes. You give them food. You meet their needs. His conclusion in the same way. Verse 17, James. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, here's another word we need to define, and, and that we, we define the word save in the context of James chapter 2. Save means from the judgment that you're going to face before Christ, not from hell, because he's already talking to believers, and believers are born again. And because they're born again, they're already children of God. They've believed and received been adopted as children of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. They're born-again believers. So the issue here isn't salvation. The issue here is the judgment before, before Christ. And so what does dead mean? It means useless. It means ineffective. We could probably even say in context unprofitable. In Greek and in Hebrew and in English, dead never means non-existent. Yet there are some who teach that a dead faith is no faith at all. But the definition of dead here is useless, unproductive, ineffective, unprofitable. It doesn't mean non-existent. So when we stand before the bema seat of Jesus Christ and he looks at our works, not at our faith, we've already been redeemed by our faith in Jesus Christ to save us. He's looking at our works. And James says, when he looks at your works, if your faith is not accompanied by any of them, if it doesn't have any action to it, if it's dead, it's of no use. It's not profitable. So James also implies here that, that works are, are profitable for something more than standing before the bema seat of, uh, of Christ. You know what else works are profitable for? They're profitable for the people that you're doing them for. It's profitable for, for the person who, who's, who's cold and doesn't have the right clothes. And it's profitable for the person who does not have their daily food. For you doing your works, it's profitable not only before the, the bema seat of, uh, of, of Christ. It's profitable for the actual people that you're ministering to. And listen, it's profitable for someone else. It's profitable for you. As you mature in your faith, you see, as you mature in your understanding of who Jesus Christ is and what good works that he wants you to do, what he's already prepared for you to do as you begin walking. That, that's maturity, right? When, when my son was a little baby, you know, um, we didn't get on him and say, man, why aren't you walking? You're already eight months old. There's something wrong with this baby. He doesn't have works, right? Eventually, he got to his rubbery little legs, and he took a step forward. We were all so excited, right? He wasn't running a marathon. He was just taking a little step. And so listen, the profit of works is for us as well. It shows that we're on our way, that we're making progress, that we're maturing, that we're becoming perfect in, in our faith. So they're beneficial before Christ, in the Bema Seat, they're beneficial for those who are hurting, and they're beneficial to energize and mature our faith, not from saving us from hell. Otherwise, we'd be saying, well, Christ's death on the cross is not good enough. There's something else we must do. And there is not, except to receive. Now, this is a challenging thought for some people to understand or even accept that uh, we're so convinced that there's really um, 
no connection between faith and works. So we, we don't see how the works can help energize us or mature our faith. And so James is going to play the protagonist here. He's going to, in James 2.18, um, uh, offer an objection to faith and works in, in this uh, context that he's, he's created. So the objector, we're on number three, the, the objector. The objector says, look, I don't believe that there's any connection between faith and works. And this is what he says, but someone will say, that's the objector. You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there's one God good, even the demons believe that, and shudder. Now, the problem with this passage is, where does the quotation start, and where does the quotation end? Because listen, in the Greek, they don't have quotation marks. And so that's up to the interpreter to decide where did the quotation start and where does it end. And it's kind of a weird little quotation, right? I mean, just play with that in your mind for a second. Go, okay. Now, is it someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. And then James starts answering. That's what it says in the NIV. James starts answering. The objector. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. But I'm prone to say that what I understand about quotations in the Bible, it always starts with the words, but someone will say. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses uh, 35 through 36, Paul has a quotation. Look, look how he starts it. But someone may ask. So that's just like, quote. Somebody may ask. He's about to quote the person who's, who's going to ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come? All right? And now we know it's in quote because they make a derogatory remark about the person they're quoting. And the derogatory remark here is, how foolish. And now starts the response to, to the objector or to the question or to the quote. How foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. So... The same is true here in James, I believe. I know, this is kind of crazy because people don't usually talk about this kind of stuff. But I think it's important to know where the quotation starts and where the quotation ends so we can understand what Paul is trying to do with the objector so that we can know what he's trying, the point he's trying to make at the, with, with, his, with his rebuttal to the objector. And so... James introduces the quote in the normal way, but someone will say, okay, that's where the quote starts. And then notice where he finishes, right? Even the demons believe and shudder, you foolish man. Where's the derogatory remark? You foolish man is the derogatory remark. So perhaps the quotation ends with and shudder. And then James begins his rebuttal, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without works is useless? So here's what I believe the objector is trying to prove. He's trying to prove that faith is unseen. There's no way you can see faith. There's no way believers can even show their faith. So he says, but someone is going to say, all right then, let's say that you have the correct beliefs and I have the correct actions. Go ahead, try to say that. Take some belief of yours and make it visible by means of your actions. And if you can do that, but of course you can't, then I will take my actions and will make my belief visible through them, which is utterly impossible. Oh, I know. You're going to claim that, that your faith in the unity of God is demonstrated by your good conduct. You believe that there's one God. I disallow that claim, and I'll show you why. Because demons also believe the same thing. You believe that there's one God. It doesn't do them any good. They only tremble or shudder. So what's the objector saying? He's basically saying that there's no true connection between faith and works. But if James knows there is a connection, right? That's the point he's already been trying to prove. To the beleaguered believers. They're not the objectors. They're the beleaguered believers who need to be encouraged how to live kingdom come. And so he wants to tell them that, no, there's a connection between what you believe, your faith in Jesus Christ to save you, and how you live. 
And so he says, you foolish man, you don't believe that there's a connection between faith and works. Let me show you what the Bible says, which is brilliant. Because whenever you have an objector, you should always point them to say, but this is in my opinion. Let me show what the Bible says, how the Bible answers the question. And so James pulls an example from the middle of Abraham's life. And Abraham, of course, they're Jewish believers, right? They put their faith in Christ, but they have this great heritage of faith that started way back with Abraham, right? The father of their faith. And he quotes the Old Testament. He says, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete or mature or perfect by what he did. So there's a connection, he says. All you got to do is look at the life of Abraham. By the way, I said he started in the middle of Abraham's life. He didn't start at the original place where, where um, Abraham was justified by his faith. How was Abraham saved? Like we're saved, so says uh, Galatians chapter 3 and Romans chapter 3, right? It says that he was saved by faith, just like we are saved. When God said, I'm going to make you a nation, I'm going to have a covenant with you, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and it said, Abraham believed. And that's what saved Abraham, just like when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. So it's interesting, he didn't, he's not talking about his faith saving him. He's talking about what happens because we're saved is that we begin to sow into our life kingdom come. And when does Abraham start sowing this into his life? When his faith becomes a little bit mature, where he takes a, some rubbery steps and, and he starts walking and now he's, he's going with God. He's left behind his foolishness. Remember all that foolishness when, when, he, when he left to follow God? He had all this foolish stuff that he was doing. He, he hung out with um, Hagar, and he shouldn't have done that. That was disobedience. He, right, he pawned his wife off as his sister twice. This is not you know heroic faith we're talking about. This is immature faith. But by the time his faith matures and, and it becomes perfect, he has deeds to go along with his, with his trust in salvation, uh, his faith that has brought him salvation. And, and the result is, is that his faith becomes mature so that when God says, hey, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him, man, Abraham's gone. He's packed up the donkeys. He, he, he's got the wood. He's got the fire. He's got the sun. Son asks, hey, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Abraham says, I got faith. God is going to provide it. You see, this is a different Abraham. He's got faith. And he's showing that faith in what he's doing. And scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend you see that a person is justified declared righteous by what he does and not by faith alone in other words people are declared righteous they're they're um, uh, justified they're shown to be a friend of God by their obedience their faith brings them into a forever relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ and that faith works that's what James is saying, and the good that comes out of that is that we show others that kingdom has come. We store up uh, rewards for us when we're going to appear before the bema seat of, of Christ, and we actually physically help people, and it shows that our faith is maturing. But it doesn't stop there. And James gives another example from the scripture. He says, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? What's, well, what, what's James saying? James is saying that works makes faith profitable. Now, here's somebody totally different than Abraham. It's Rahab. One, she's a woman. Two, she's a Gentile. Right? But she's saved the same way Abraham is. That's the great good news. Just like all of us, we're saved the same way by, by faith. Here's her faith declaration when the spies come. She says, I know that there's a God. And everybody here in our city is afraid. I believe in that God. 
would you secure my life, right? And not only does God secure her life, but he puts her into the very lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. She's, right. She's in the pages, right? She's one of the ancestors of, uh, of Jesus Christ. It's incredible. And listen, in Rahab's life, you know what? Her faith with her works are right away. Abraham's take a while. I mean, they take a, a while. And Rahab, man, she's above the curve, man. She's, she's already willing to do something with what she believes. And what she believes is that God is going to take over Jericho. And that anyone who's not on God's side is going to be dead. And so she puts her faith in, in God to save her. And then she, she hides the spies. And, the, and, and their response is, we're going to do something for you. So hang a cord out your window so that we'll know where you and your family are when we come against the city. And you know what? As soon as those guys took off, guess what? She hung out of her window. A cord. She didn't wait for like 10 days or a week or until they started marching around Jericho. Oh, I better put the cord out now. And immediately she put it out. And her faith had an immediate impact on her physical life. It kept her from, from being killed. Dead faith that doesn't have any actions can't do that. Here's the point. And I know you were waiting for me to get to this, right? What is the point of all of this stuff? Maybe I should have just started here. The point is this. Faith... Without works is useless. It's what James says in verse 26. As a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. We know dead isn't, doesn't mean lost, like without salvation. We know dead here, it's for the believer. Dead here means that it's useless. It's useless for the people who need to see kingdom come, which is really the primary concern that James has here. It's useless for the believer who's going to stand before the bema seat of Christ and receive a reward for the works that he's done, she's done in this body for the cause of the king and his kingdom. And it's useless to see our faith be perfected, to be matured. Just as the spirit energizes and makes the body useful, so works, James would say, energizes faith and makes faith productive and profitable. The question's going to be when you stand before the, before the king, was your faith profitable? Was it any good? Or was it dead? And was it useless? So this morning we've talked about faith. We've talked about faith in the life of a believer. And, and here's the, the way that we end and, and, and it's with the call for you if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you, to first, to, to, to get that settled. And you know, you could settle that right, right now. You say, well, I don't know if I can do enough of, you know, I haven't learned the Christian two-step. I don't know if I, I can, you know, jump through all the hoops that I have to that God requires for me to be saved. Listen, here's the work of God. You ready? Jesus said it in John, right? He said, the work of God is this to believe in the one he sent. Listen, that's work all of us can do today. We, by faith, put our trust in Jesus Christ to save us. What we're saying is we believe that we did what he did on the cross is enough. It's enough to, to wipe out, to obliterate our sin. It's enough to bring us into a forever relationship with God that this is his plan that he so loved the world that he gave his, his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And his spirit would come to live inside of each one who make that declaration of faith in Jesus Christ to save them. And his spirit, you see, is the one who begins to initiate our ability and our desire to do good works. So maybe you're here this morning, you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ. Well, I'm telling you, he wants you. 
He loves you. He, he's pursued you all the way to church this morning. Even made you sit in a, an unfamiliar seat so you might be a little bit uncomfortable today. So that he could get your attention and say to you, I love you. I have a plan for your life. Put your trust in my son, Jesus, to save you. Listen, if that's your desire this morning, if that's what, what the spirit of God is moving in your heart for you to do, then in just a moment, you can come to the front and, and, and pray with me. There's going to be uh, people who are on the sides and a couple more up here that are here to pray with you as well. You can mark it on your connection card that's in your bulletin. We want you to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, here's another issue, because I believe that uh, many people here this morning already have Christ as their Savior. You've already committed your life to him. The problem is, is that nobody's been challenging you to do anything with that. But James is. He's saying this is what our faith is all about. Our faith is about, uh, is about uh, ministering to, to those who are in distress, orphans and widows, and keeping ourselves unpolluted from the world. This is how we live kingdom come. Kingdom come is all about not showing favoritism, but instead living the law of Jesus Christ, the royal law which says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I mean, there should be some tension in our lives because Christian, when we look at ourselves, we're going, oh, I'm not, I'm not even interested in some of that. Well, you ought to be. And so perhaps this morning, what you need to do is you need to uh, go to one of the people on the side, come to me, and just spend a moment praying and say, hey, I'm asking that the Spirit of God would be liberated in my life. Oh, he's there if you're a believer. He's there, but, but what, what use is he if you're not submitting your life to him, if you're not submitting your will to him? And perhaps today what you need to do is just go and pray with someone and just say, hey, will you pray with me that, that the Spirit would be liberated in my life, that I can become a a doer of the word, not only a hearer. Whatever you need, this is your time. Let's stand, and as we stand and sing, as God leads, you come.